Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to see all of you here today. And I know that one common factor has brought us together, and that is our very fond memories of Dr. Arun Tikekar, whose uh, birthday falls on this day. I am particularly grateful to our speaker for having agreed to be here with us, and because for us this is a very significant evening. So, um, Mr. Bhatia, thank you for being here, and I'm also very happy to see Dr. Manisha Tikekar with us because it's a very special day for her as well. Before I call upon our main speaker to be to join us here, I would like to share a thought because I think today we are actually celebrating all that Dr. Tikekar has done for us through the years at the at the Asiatic Society. And um, this is what I would like to share with all of you. Those we love never go away. They walk beside us every day. Unseen, unheard, still near, still special, still missed, and still very dear. So with these thoughts about Dr. Tikekar, I would like to carry on with this evening's program, and I'll begin by inviting our um, speaker, Mr. Siddharth Bhatia, to take his place where he belongs today at the Julius. I'd like to also invite our president, Mr. S. G. Kali, to join Mr. Bhatia at the Dais. And um, I will also expect Dr. Meena Vaishambhayan, who is not just the Vice President of the Asiatic Society, but also the Chairperson of the Dr. Arun Tikikar Center for Advanced Studies. She should take her place here, but before, before she takes her place here, uh, or rather, you will, uh, sorry. Because later I will be asking her to take charge as well. But we will begin this evening session uh, with Mr. Kale giving his introductory remarks. So, Mr. Kale, would you like to begin? Respected trustee, Dr. Suma Chitnis. I hope I'm not missing any others. Can you hear me? No. Not very well. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah no. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Suma Chitnis, the office bearers of the society, members of the managing committee, and friends. We have gathered today for the annual function of the Dr. Arun Tikekar Center for Advanced Studies. You will recall that after the sudden and untimely demise of Dr. Arun Tikekar, our former president, on 19th January 2016, the managing committee had decided that to honor the memory of Dr. Arun Tikekar, a renowned scholar and a veteran journalist, a center for advanced studies should be set up in his name to promote research and programs in certain fields of activities which were dear to him. These were identified as history and local history, humanities, including language and gender studies, journalism in all its aspects, ethics and values in public life, society and culture, erstwhile Bombay presidency, and education. 
In addition, it was decided to raise Tikekar Memorial Fund and to use the proceeds by way of interest to award Dr. Arun Tikekar Memorial Fellowship of Rs. 1.25 lakhs to a deserving research scholar who would be chosen by an independent jury. Last year, first such fellowship was given to Mr. Suhas Bahulkar, who is a well-known artist and an author. The subject of his center, uh, research centers around the Bombay Revivalist School. This year, the research area chosen were different aspects of journalism. The shaping of public opinion through discourse, the pursuit of credibility, challenges of the new media and emerging technology, the new media and emerging technologies. The last date for application was 30th November 2017. A joint meeting of the permanent members of the jury and subject experts took place on 12th January 2018. It considered the seven applications received within the specified time. Out of the applications, the subject experts recommended and the permanent jury accepted the name of Mr. Ajay Subhash Kautikwar. I think he can stand up if he is here. Ajay Subhash Kautikwar. Accordingly, the Dr. Arun Tikekar Memorial Research Fellowship for the year 2018-19 will be awarded to Dr. Ajay Kautikwar, to Mr. Ajay Kautikwar. I am doing it in advance. <laughs> On behalf of the society, I extend my congratulations to Mr. Ajay Kautikwar and thank the jury and the subject experts for their endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kale, for making this announcement and for making one person very happy, I'm sure, that he has been selected by the jury. As I said, I will be uh, handing over the proceedings to the person who is the chairperson of the Dr. Arun Tegar Center for Advanced Studies. So Dr. Meena Vaishampayan, would you please now address the gathering? Dear friends, good evening. Very happy to meet all of you after a year's gap for this reason and very happy to hear the announcement of this second fellowship of uh, which is awarded to Mr. Ajay Kautikwar. His uh, subject for the proposal is challenges of new media and technology. Let me just uh, brief you once again that this selection is done on two levels with the, as uh, our president said, with an um, independent jury committee. We have three permanent juries and two expert juries because we have decided that every year the subject of the research will be different. That is, all the subjects which were dear, as you know, Dr. Tikekar really had a multifaceted personality. And so, we have jotted down some six and seven subjects which alternatively will be the research areas for that year. Last year, as our president said it was history, local history, etc. And this year it was journalism. So, two subject experts, sub experts in the concerned fields will be appointed every year. So, this year also two subject experts have selected this fellow, Ajay Kautikwar, after having some interviews, after he had sent his proposal, talking to him, guiding him, and 
now he is ready for his research work for the whole year. So I too, on behalf of all our committee members, congratulate you. I am very happy to tell you, last year was the first year we started with the fellowship. This is second year we are having one more activity of this center that we are trying to have a lecture which is concerned with that subject which is given for the research area. And today, a very distinguished speaker, Mr. Siddharth Bhatti is amongst us. That is another uh, thing for which I am happy about. One more thing, last year, we have sort of inaugurated a special collection which is donated by Dr. Manisha Tikekar and named as Dr. Tikekar's collection, which is uh, displayed in our vestibule with the cupboards. This year, she is so generous, she had given us some more books which can add to that uh, list of all those distinguished books also. And for that, I am thankful to her for giving and thinking about Asiatic for donating such valuable books. Now, today we will have uh, Ajay Kautikwar will speak about his research area for some minutes. And I request our chief speaker today, Mr. Siddharth Bhatia, to hand over the first check advance check of rupees 25,000 to the fellow. So that will be a sort of basing, uh, blessing and support from a senior journalist to a new researcher. All the formalities we will do later on. I will just ask him, request him to hand over the check. Thank you. So now I request Ajay Kautikwar to speak for some time. Sir, Kai, sir, Madam, Sagan Shamshi, Nemish Slark Kaslele, Kitkar, sir, Tikakar, Madam, and Serva Mitran. Ya Bhagat Javabi, Nemi, a say, Teva Asiatic Library, Chihi Dekani was to Nemi Kunavata Semana. Nemi Audisaki, but Kadidari Gila Pai Japan, Kamachata, the Havar Sadali Mumbai, Kun, but Kadimaza Sayana Salam of the Library Made. Ya Fellowship Chamatimatun. Asiatic Sea, Nars Old Ligili, Zodla Gelo Tatsai Kananda. To Srap Sakat Menta Pahile Abhar Asiatic Library Chad Universe Samitisha, Kitani Majia Fellowship Sadi Never Kili, Tacha Patel Manapurvak Abhar. Karamanje Javami Hevatsle subjects, Tevamalaha subject appeals a la current with Tak Shetrat Kam Kurto. Gili the Havarsha. पंधरा वर्षा पस्तन पत्रकारी थे तो नहीं दहा वर्षा मुंबई इलेक्ट्रॉनिक प्रिंट टाइम्स अगर माध्यमात काम करता ना जब हजब बदल आए सगरा डिजिटल माध्यम आलरंतर जा हे जब सगर सित्यंतर आए ते आता स्वतः आमी अनुभव तो है त्या अनुभव तुन जातो है त्याचा मोड़ या विषय जर अपने ला संशोधन कराला मुलाकाती नंतर निवड झाले असं मला कळालं त्याचा मला आनंद आहे हा जो विषय आहे अतिशय व्यापक आणि खूप असा मोठा आहे डिजिटल माध्यम असं म्हणतात की गेल्या 100 वर्षात जे बदल झाले नाहीत ते गेल्या काही 10 वर्षात या पत्रकारितेच्या क्षेत्रात झाले आणि ते आम्ही अनुभवतोय जे पूर्ण सिनेरियो चेंज झाला लिखाणाची स्टाईल बदलली सादरीकरण बदललं प्रत्येक गोष्ट बदलली आम्हाला जो पहिले अभिमान असायचा की पत्रकार म्हणजे पहिले सगळ्यात पहिले बातमी आम्हाला कळते आता तो आमचा जो अभिमान आहे तो आता शून्य झालाय म्हणजे गळून पडलाय कारण आलेली बातमी लोकांना द्यायची आणि प्रत्येक जण व्यक्त व्हायला लागलं पत्रकार बनलाय पण हे माध्यम जसं आधुनिक आहे तसंच ते सुसाट वेगही आहे त्याला आता या वेगाला जर एक चौकट आपण आखली नाही तर हे माध्यम जे आहे ते काय करेल काय नाही 
कारण पत्रकारितेचा जो आत्मा आता आत्मा आपला आहे ट्रस्ट विश्वसनीयता त्या विश्वसनीयतेलाच धक्का लागण्याची शक्यता आहे आणि या संशोधनाच्या माध्यमातून त्यावर आपल्याला काही करता येईल का जनरल बोलणं आणि जेव्हा संशोधन करून एका शास्त्रीय पद्धतीनं त्याची काही मांडणी करणं हे करता येईल का आता या सगळा प्रयोग हे करणार या अभ्यासातून करण्याचा मी प्रयत्न करणार आहे दुसरं दडपडही मला असाच भान असलेला आणि अतिशय अभ्यासपूर्ण लिहिलेला एका अशा मोठ्या संपादकाच्या नावाने आपल्याला ही फेलोशिप मिळते त्याचंही एक दडपण आलं पण हे दडपण पॉझिटिव्ह होतं म्हणजे आपल्याला काहीतरी चांगलं करायला मिळेल अशी एक एनर्जी एक ऊर्जा त्याच्यातून मला मिळाली आणि हे सगळं करताना जेव्हा मी विषयपत्रिका वाचली त्याच्यात मला त्याचं उत्तर पण मिळालं की या हा जो विषय आहे जर्नलिझम चॅलेंजेस ऑफ न्यू मीडिया अँड इमर्जिंग टेक्नॉलॉजी आजचा भाटीय सरांचा जो विषय आहे धर्म ऑफ जर्नालिझम कुठलाही क्षेत्र असो जर्नालिझम असो शिक्षक असो विद्यार्थी असो कुठलाही पेशा असो जेव्हा त्या पेशाचा धर्म विसरतो त्याची जे मूल्य विसरतात तेव्हाच मग प्रश्न निर्माण होतात आपणही उत्सुक आहोत आजचं व्याख्यान ऐकायला ही जी मूल्य आपण विसरलो किंवा कुठलेही क्षेत्र विसरतं तेव्हा का प्रश्न निर्माण होतात तुमच्याप्रमाणे मलाही उत्सुकता आहे पुन्हा एकदा सगळ्यांचे आभार मानतो आणि या फेलोशिपला साजेस काम माझ्याकडनं होईल तुमच्या सगळ्यांचीही मला सहकार्य लाभेल अशी अपेक्षा व्यक्त करतो धन्यवाद आय वुड लाईक टू जस्ट इंटिमेट यू दॅट सुहास बवलकर हॅज कम्प्लिटेड हिज वर्क अँड ॲक्च्युअली ही वॉज सपोज टू Uh, give a presentation here as per last year we have already said but he said that he will need more than one hour to give the complete presentation with audio visual uh, uh, clips and all and that is why we have just postponed this program for some other day we will intimate you please do come for that program as well So we look forward to seeing uh, all of you back again when Mr. Suhas Pahulkar will talk, uh, talk to us about his project that he's worked on for the whole year. And I think we can look forward to next year when uh, Mr. Ajay Kautrikwa will be ready with all the ideas. He's so full of ideas and I can see that he is really raring to go. And uh, congratulations and I'm sure you'll end up with some excellent ideas. Um, something that we at the center can be proud of thank you for what you shared with us today so what i'm sure we've all been looking forward to uh, and um, before i request mr siddharth patia to speak on well to me it sounds a very interesting topic the dharma of journalism i didn't know there was a dharma but we'll see uh, but uh, before as i said we invite him I'd like to request Smruti Kopikar, a member of our committee, to introduce the speaker, Smruti. Good evening to everybody. Um, if I may, I would like to begin with Dr. Tikeka's words uh, from the book Power, Pen and Patronage. He writes, The media today, print as well as electronic, is knowingly or unknowingly manipulated by the high and the powerful. And it, in turn, manipulates a de-intellectualized society. The real issues that need immediate attention are overlooked. Wedding extravaganzas of wealthy celebrities acquire fairy tale proportions. And the cricket World Cup frenzy kindles instant jingoism all over and the reality is that there is no one really to bell the cat how long will this situation last is anybody's guess but improve it must in the days of struggle for survival ethical issues and social responsibilities tend to be put on hold unquote He spoke these words 10 years ago and they were then printed in this book. 
in the last 10 years, you will perhaps agree with me that the situation has turned worse or nearly worse. And redeeming that to a considerable extent in his personal and professional capacity is Mr. Siddharth Bhatia, our speaker for the evening. Mr. Bhatia comes here with nearly four decades in journalism. He's worked as a reporter and an editor in mainstream publications. He has written extensively on politics, popular culture, media. He teaches young journalists. He is an author. Among the books that he has to his credit is one on typewriters, which I'm sure many people here would feel extremely nostalgic about. Um, three years ago, he, with two other journalists, set up the mainstream online publication called The Wire. I'm sure some of you have heard of it, probably read it and follow it all the time. In which case, you'd also know that in this plethora of online publications that are now around us, basically listicles and things like that, The Wire stands out for two things. One, it has the spine to speak truth to power, as journalists should. And two, it is in today's India, in English language journalism, the only completely independent, non-corporate, non-profit media organization. It is not yoked to any corporate house, nor to any political interests. It runs mainly on donations, from people like you and me. And for that, to be able to do that and sustain that is quite a task in itself. Mr. Bhatia knew Dr. Tikekar very well. In fact, he had Dr. Tikekar write uh, opinion and comment articles in the DNA when he was the edit page editor. And I should think that Dr. Tikekar would have been happy with and proud of The Wire. Presenting to you this evening, Mr. Siddharth Patia on the Dharma of Journalism. But before that, a small welcome to him on behalf of the Asiatic Society. everyone hear me? So, firstly, very happy to see so many people here. Uh, it's a weekday uh, and uh, it is also budget day. What, how that affects our lives on a daily basis, I don't know, but sometimes people get very excited about these things. But when I was asked whether I would uh, come for this, I immediately said yes to Smriti, immediately. My only concern at that stage was whether the date would suit me. My life is uh, now uh, beholden to my work, of course, but also to uh, uh, court cases. And uh, I have uh, dates which get uh, uh, told to us each time by the courts. Um, when I say courts, it's more than one. And um, I have been um, traveling a bit to Ahmedabad where most of our uh, court cases are, not all of them, but some of them. So it all depends on the magistrate. I have learned so much about the legal system. I can tell you one thing, the legal system actually does work quite well, uh, provided uh, you have people who uh, argue your case well, and provided that there is a, an independent-minded judge, and we have been very fortunate to have both because uh, the magistrates have been saying, let us move on, and our uh, lawyers have been uh, kind of pushing the case. But even then, what it means is that I have to go to Ahmedabad, so I told her, I said, if I am in Ahmedabad um, on this date, fortunately that date is not today, it is in the next couple of days, so just missed it and made it. 
So I'm uh, very honored uh, because uh, not only was Arun a friend of mine, not only was a contributor, not only was he a mentor of sorts, uh, he was a person I could go to for so many of my interests and my professional work. I could discuss Maharashtra politics, but I could also discuss Bombay presidency, something that I was quite, I am still quite interested in. And um, it is in keeping with things that his last book was, uh, last book, Intellectuals, The Deintellectualization of uh, uh, Mumbai. And uh, it was in keeping witness of things that he wrote that book because he had researched and seen a time when this was a city which was the center of intellectual activity and he was seeing right in front of him the gradual erosion of that intellectual tradition. So I immediately said, yes. What I liked about Arun, uh, among other things, uh, was also that um, he was very, very proud of his own culture, but he was a complete cosmopolitan. This is what I really liked. I mean, we could discuss the Raj and he had no value judgments to make of any sort. He just looked at it as a scholar and he discussed it with him. I really like that, that in an environment of total nativism, total national, neo-nationalism, that here was a man who could be the dispassionate intellectual and scholar and talk about it and explain things to you in context. So I said yes. And I keep wondering, actually this was provoked because I was invited here, I kept wondering what would he have made of the India of today? I don't have to expand on that. I think this is an audience which will make up its own mind. The subject that you have chosen and asked me to speak on couldn't be more relevant. India is a, at a crucial juncture of our history and institutions and ideals we have loved and held up as our fundamental values are facing an unprecedented challenge. We look, we took these ideals for granted, convinced that while they may be questioned, they would remain our guiding spirits. But now they are in a crisis, and without being too pessimistic, I would say they are facing a mortal crisis. If we do not resist and fight back, they could soon be history. Many of our cherished institutions are facing a real danger today of being uh, undercut, of being destroyed and uh, sometimes it amazes me how did it happen so fast but of course we know in a heart of hearts that this erosion has been coming for a long time journalism which is a pillar of our society our democracy is one such india has been proud with some justification of its journalism tra tradition journalism in, in india goes back a long time to around the late 18th century, when Hickey's Gazette was started, which in its two years managed to question Warren Hastings in Bengal and his administration and was shut down in two years by the East India Company. This was happening even in those days. Since then, of course, the media has grown and the context has completely changed. But the fundamental premise that journalism is about questioning authority, demanding answers, has remained unaltered. That is really the crux of the whole thing, that as a journalist, it is my duty to ask questions and ask questions on behalf of the citizenry. <coughs> In the pre-1947 period, nationalist newspapers took on the British establishment and paid a heavy price. Even British editors like B.G. Horniman were deported. The paper I began my own career with alas, no longer what it used to be, the Free Press Journal, was founded by Mr. Sadanand, who was shut down several times and was in and out of jail. During the emergency, many journalists went to jail. There are, of course, the episodes we remember. Those are, of course, the episodes we remember. Many journalists also were completely pro-establishment. They bent, crawled, and did many more things. The spirit of questioning, however, was deeply embedded in Indian journalism. There was no dearth of 
chamcha journalists, owners and editors who want to be close and soft on the establishment of the day. But basic value systems that the fourth estate stood apart, leaning on the side of the citizen rather than on the side of the powers that be were understood by all. Let us take the situation four years ago. Our brave, I call them electronic warriors, every night you see them shouting. And uh, you admire their bravery. The shouting anchors, the high profile editors, the owners, they all were demonstrating their own independence by taking on the UPA government barely four years ago. Of course, there was a lot to criticize, as it should be. But to me, as a professional journalist with some experience, the whole thing was looking a bit manufactured. Then the question arises, how is it that the same tigers who were roaring are now purring like cats? Why do they snuggle up to the government and the ruling party? Um, since somebody must already be thinking on it, I might as well tell you. Why do they take selfies with the Prime Minister? Uh, I'm trying to remember, of course I didn't walk around with a big camera, but I'm trying to uh, remember if, if I met somebody, whether I asked my photographer to take a picture of me. It is not that I was holier than thou, but it was simply uh, something you did not do. Because after all, you love being close to a leader and uh, you know, a chief minister or even a prime minister and there were journalists who liked the idea of being good. But somewhere I think that distance was there. Now to be speaking on their behalf, giving explanations on their behalf, and the moment you see them to be standing next to them and taking selfies, there is something very, very seriously wrong. Today you see journalists on television constantly ask questions about the opposition, no matter what, you, uh, what the issue is. So the economy can collapse, what is Rahul Gandhi doing about it? The, there could be anything the opposition is called to account. You know, we can laugh about these things, we can joke about these things, and I really, uh, I find it very, very uh, intriguing, and actually, you know, in a strange way, very, it makes me happy that uh, certain names, when they are mentioned uh, in uh, any kind of situation, you can go to a college and say certain names, and the uh, audience laughs, which means that they have become figures who need to be mocked. But this is not good for the profession. I might enjoy that mocking of somebody else, but this is really not good for the profession. This level of partisanship has reduced them to pamphleteers and government spokesmen, and while they have their followers, it has opened them to ridicule and mockery. How did we reach you? How did the Indian media, which after its shameful record during the emergency, spring back with new vigor and began doing investigative journalism, fought the government every time there was a perceived threat, get reduced to this joke. We need to go back a bit. In the late 1970s and 1980s, Indian journalism had begun to change. The boom in new publications created new jobs. It meant more money for journalists. You could be earning a salary of a thousand rupees and get offered a job where the next salary was 2,500 rupees. A lot of money in those days. But you can just imagine the jump. <coughs> Journalism began to attract those who came for the salary and the glamour. But the conditions attached that where you joined on a contract basis rather than on a wage board salary, which was government mandated. This in turn meant that the journalist trade union, which negotiated with the managements, was weakened. Slowly, journalism became a profession from a trade, and a sense of mission was lost. <coughs> it meant journalists moved jobs for higher salaries, and those salaries were very, very important, but were more vulnerable to being asked to go. They were more vulnerable to be told by their management, write this, don't write that. This made managements more powerful, and with higher salaries, journalists also became closer to the establishment, whether political and worse, 
in my opinion, to the corporate. In effect, their teeth were removed, their claws were taken out. Another significant milestone which changed journalism was when the Times of India began selling its newspaper for the price of rupees one. Newspaper economics, um, I don't know how many of you understand it, is a very strange thing. A paper that you get in the morning for 4 to 5 rupees actually costs 15 to 18 rupees to produce. Every time the circulation goes up, the company is losing money. So how is that gap met? Why are you getting the newspaper for 4 rupees when it is taking so much money to produce? That gap is met by the advertiser. The advertiser is so pleased with the large circulation that he is ready to pay any level of um, a very, very expensive. An ad in some of the leading papers can be very, very expensive. But you see what happens. The power structure shifts. Now the advertiser calls the shots. This does not mean, as most people think, that you, you cannot write against uh, advertiser A or advertiser B. It can mean that, but it is not just that. The powerful advertisers will make sure nothing appears about them. Uh, I don't need to give names here, but you will not, you will be very surprised if you find anything negative written about people who probably pay up to 15 crores or 20 crores a year to a newspaper house to, uh, for advertising. It's just not that. It is an entirely more uh, subtextual kind of uh, result. The fallout is more subtle in the sense that now if an advertiser is selling a flat and wooing you to buy that apartment for 15 crores or a car for 25 lakhs, that advertiser does not want a newspaper environment around that ad which is depressing. So, I don't have to tell you this, you all read the media every morning, you will not find coverage of things that may apparently be depressing. Therefore, the poor have been completely forgotten. Farmer stories come once in a while, only when there is something tragic like a suicide or they come out on the street. And the vulnerable, the voiceless and the poor are no longer um, written about. Uh, my friend uh, Kumar is sitting here. Kumar, you have not left, right? No, I'm here. Yeah, so Kumar is sitting here. Kumar was the labor correspondent of the Economic Times. Think about it. The Economic Times, which went every morning to every chieftain, every corporate uh, boss, every CEO, every chairman, every executive. There was a labor coverage in that paper because it is not as if it is a myth to think that that corporate boss does not want to know about what the labor is doing. Forget labor correspondence. Where is labor? Where is labor trade unionism? People forget we are sitting in these hallowed halls. You know, I'm really proud of this institution. I come here quite often. And I was just telling uh, Dr. Vashampayan how wonderful it is to see statues of people who have built this city. And people forget that Bombay has always and was always a working class city. We may look at all the buildings, but this was built on the backbone of the working class. That working class is gone, so where is the need to cover them? Can you imagine that 25 years of the riots happened, the newspapers ignored it. The textile strike, forget it, it's a long forgotten thing. Those textile strike workers have not disappeared, they're still around, two and a half lakh. Their families are around, many of them are waiting for a house. But why would they be written about if writing about them would depress the reader, the advertiser, the owner? And at the end of the day, the government, when I use words like the establishment, I mean this ecosystem, which then starts, um, you know, getting bothered if you are writing about these things. Now, I must tell you that I disagree with those who say that why is there too much entertainment in newspapers? They should be. It's a big business. Why not? 
but it depends on prioritization. So just a little bit uh, a word about the wire. When we started it, um, Smithy said um, there were three journalists who got together. We got together because we were out of a job and we were uh, not even, not just unemployed, we were unemployable, to be quite honest. And we threw in some money into the pot, one lakh rupees each. Well, the wire was started with one lakh rupees each and for 16 months it ran without a salary, we, we ran without a salary, without a staff and without an office. And of course, without paying our contributors. We called everybody we knew and said, please write. And it must be karma. <coughs> but they all wrote. We got some money halfway uh, in about a year. And uh, it was very little money. But that was enough money to take three or four staff. We discovered that we, 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 were, we had no idea about running a business, but we discovered somewhere along the way that without having an accountant and filing your taxes, you cannot exist. So we had to find some money from somewhere to pay the accountant. Every time I went to Delhi to meet my colleague, I had to find a way to stay with a friend or something like that. This is how we started. But there was one thing very clear in our heads, that the wire would have, the wire would renew the contract between the reader between society and between the right. The wire was not here to talk on behalf of the government, it was here to ask questions to the government. A lot of people say, you people are completely anti this government. That is a, that's a completely nonsensical statement on two grounds. One, because if there was some other government, we would have been doing the same thing. Two, in an environment where everybody is supporting the government, anything you say, any question you ask sounds like you are being negative. So, we don't agree with that. But the fundamental philosophy has been, was this, has remained this, that we will give voice to the voiceless, represent the stories unheard, um, I remember one of the discussions uh, during the setting up of the wire was um, there are hundreds of stories in even printed in newspapers. I'm not even saying out there. Printed in newspapers in the morning, small, medium. All we have to do is pick them up. And we do that a lot because you will find something so little and we will just go after it and pick it up and then people say, oh, but, you know, why are you so against the government? And we are not the only ones who are doing it. Let me assure you, a new class of journalists is emerging. They are doing it. So, but my earlier point was that the whole social scenario changed, the media scenario changed. I think somewhere instinctively newspaper owners, television owners also realized that they just needed to talk to a, this tiny community, uh, for want of a better, I would call them the petit bourgeoisie. Um, all the Marxists here, please forgive me. Uh, I, they, 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 have, they have their needs, they need their nationalism to be tickled on a daily basis. They have very few concerns over and beyond their immediate lives. And they have figured out that in a country with this vast population. So the end result is you as a society are being underserved by the media today. Worse is, <clears throat> I don't know whether you realize that uh, all these summits that are happening with media houses doing, you know, the Prime Minister comes to inaugurate um, and they have uh, conclaves and summits and conferences, which is not a mainstream activity. That comes at a price. I wonder how many of you are aware of that uh, particular uh, episode in which the editor of a very prominent Delhi newspaper was gently, well, gently because they gave him a compensation, handsome compensation, was asked to go in the afternoon of the day that the owner had gone and met the Prime Minister. And uh, 
four or six weeks after that, that particular newspaper, uh, I'm sure you know, it's the Hindustan Times, they held a, a conference and the uh, chief guest was the Prime Minister. So, we concluded in print that he had been pushed out because the government did not like him. They were very angry. They challenged us. Once again, the threat of when you challenge somebody, the threats, several threats are in the air. Legal is always one of the options. But um, I think we are a little more savvy about legal issues now, so there's some cleverness in writing also. <laughs> but uh, it's, so you can see that there are structural changes in the, the media and there are social changes. And both have happened uh, and they exploded after liberalization. You have an entirely new uh, demographic which has emerged, which is, feels uncomfortable with history, which it does not understand or does not uh, appreciate, which feels, what, what are you seeing when there are people getting on the streets and saying, you know, this history, because this history does not suit us. So they are uncomfortable with history, they are uncomfortable with, you know, uh, the, the poor, and they are uncomfortable um, with anything that disturbs them except for their small lives. And the media panders to them. So, it has not come out of the blue. My point is, when you read a newspaper or see a television channel and say, my God, can't they understand what is going on? Why are they making such a fuss? Why are they not asking the correct questions? It is because that environment has changed where they feel that doesn't matter what they ask, their channel will make money. So we have reached this point and I don't know whether most people here, I wonder whether you've seen a movie called The Post. Uh, in The Post, um, Actually, it's a very subtle and very nuanced film. It's not about the government versus uh, Nixon versus the Washington Post. It's also about the conflict within the post. And the editor is told by his proprietor that why are you saying that you are such a great fighter for uh, media independence? You were a regular guest at the Kennedy White House and that can only mean that Kennedy was seeing you because you were a correspondent for a newspaper and not because of any other reason. Did it not compromise your independence? And he says, yes, it did. He thinks to himself and says, yes, it did. And that changes things. And the proprietor is very close to the defense secretary. And she goes to the defense secretary's home and said, you told me lies about what was happening in Vietnam. So that shifts the entire scenario. And then that is why they stand up and they fight. In the case, the judge says, media should be for the governed, not for the governor. I was looking at it. There was applause in the audience, by the way. I was very pleased. Uh, maybe they were trying to say, I hope this doesn't happen here, but I think that is a little late for that now. So actually, these are not just uncomfortable times. These are dangerous times, rarely. Do we see, I mean, journalists have been killed in India before, let's not fool ourselves. It is, India is very, very poor in terms of safety of journalists. Uh, but it's getting worse. Our, we are number 136 in the Press Freedom Index. Um, so let us not be proud of how wonderful our media is. Outside, if you go, leave this country and you go, people think that your, uh, the journal, situation of journalism today, they look at numbers, they think that the situation of journalists today here is really very, very poor. A documentary filmmaker was in Bombay just the other day, and they came to see me, um, and they said, um, are you, do you feel that you are in danger? I said, no, I don't. Do you feel there is censorship? I said, there is no censorship. But why should there be censorship? When I'm ready to muzzle myself, why should there be censorship? And I don't feel dangerous walking on the street. No, I don't. That's a fact. 
But how can I say the same thing about the thousands of journalists all over the country who may be feeling? And who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Uh, and incidentally, a criminal defamation, India is one of the few countries which still um, swear by it. Britain has given it up long ago. Um, in criminal defamation, if I lose, it's not a question of paying 10 crores or 100 crores, which I don't have, by the way. Uh, it is, I will be thrown into jail for two years. So, can I really say I feel safe? And can I really say, you know, there is no censorship? Nobody has tried to muzzle me yet, apart from these legal cases and all that. But how do we know what's happening in other publications? So, I know this is perhaps a very pessimistic presentation. Um, we should be here to celebrate Arun's life. Um, he was an editor at a time when he spoke his mind. Um, I was happy to have uh, been a kind of peer, same age, same um, time I was practicing journalist, though I think he was much uh, older and he was a guru, and I was barely uh, starting my career. I think the public in this country wants a free press. I think it wants a media that speaks their voice. I think the public is ready uh, to uh, spurn those who they think are too cozy with the government. I'm putting it in very simple and stark terms. And I say this because um, the kind of uh, feedback we get on a regular basis. I will just wind up with a small uh, instance. When uh, in October uh, we carried a story, I won't go into the details, but uh, it was on a Sunday morning. Uh, it was about the uh, fantastic business acumen of a young man. and. Uh, that young man happened to be closely connected. Barely anyone covered it. At 5 p.m., the government of India's railway minister held a press conference. It was covered live. One nobody has explained so far. The next morning, every newspaper's headline was straightforward. The wire sued. Of course, nobody mentioned our name because that would mean free publicity. Portal has been sued by merit, whether that story needs digging, further investigation, pick up the phone to the editor of the wire and say, what do you have to say? Long forgotten. Those principles are long forgotten. Nobody did that. You can imagine, this is our peers, our compatriots, our colleagues. From Monday morning, we take donations online. Our donations haven't stopped. Today, I am getting so much money from you because somebody has recognized that these people need money. It's not going to my pocket. I can assure you my salary is very, very low. But apart from that, it's not going to my pocket. So I am confident that all the pessimism here is on one side and there you have the confidence, the need, the urge in the people of this country. Everywhere I go, people come to me and say, I want to shake hands. So really speaking, that is what we are here for today. Thank you.